the paper's not affiliated with the school. Yeah, it's not part of the school, but it's, and it's got something, it's really independent, but it's distributed on campus and news racks and so on. Um, Nicole? I can't hear you. Oh, uh, not, not illegal, no. Okay. No, it's not illegal. Cigarettes aren't Ill illegal or gambling's not illegal. Okay. But, you know, a state can, and many states do, ban gambling, for example. That doesn't mean that they can ban ads about gambling. Um, the Pitt News case involves a state law that says you can't carry beer ads, alcohol ads. The purpose of the law, uh, judge, then Judge Alito uh, said, was a good one, to discourage uh, alcohol abuse by college students uh, and underage drinking. Um, and what Judge Alito did in the Pitt News case was apply the central Hudson test to this restriction on advertising. Uh, first, looked to whether the ads were truthful as opposed to false or misleading. Uh, and they were truthful, that's not a problem. So then you look to the government's interest. What is it? Is it substantial? Remember, this is intermediate scrutiny. It doesn't have to be compelling. Is it substantial? Yeah, sure. Curbing alcohol abuse and underage drinking is substantial government interest. But, Alito concludes, the restriction uh, doesn't directly advance the state's interest. Sure, advertising is likely to increase consumption, but there's no evidence, the court said, that prohibiting ads in this narrow sector of the media will do any good. <coughs> Pointing out that students would see a torrent, he says, a torrent of beer ads on television, on the radio, and other publications, uh, including the free publications that were distributed on campus, but were not um, officially uh, the college type of publications, and they carried alcohol ads. So that the restriction on carrying alcohol ads was under-inclusive. You'll hear that a lot in these First Amendment cases. A law is over-inclusive, over-broad, includes more subjects than are necessary to serve the government's interest, or under-inclusive, it can't do the job because it doesn't do enough. It doesn't restrict enough. And in this case, it didn't restrict the other ways in which students would be exposed to alcohol advertising. Uh, and under the last prong of the Central Hudson test, uh, the Pitt News decision says that the law wasn't narrowly tailored. It was both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. It was over-inclusive in that two-thirds of the student body at the University of Pittsburgh were of age, two-thirds of them, so that they don't need to be protected from, um, from beer ads, uh, and under-inclusive in that these other newspapers were um, available to students, and the state wasn't doing anything in the way of enforcing existing uh, laws and school regulations on beverage control on the campus. We're not policing it. That's something the government could have done rather than restrict speech about beer ads. And Justice Alito also concluded, independently of the commercial speech analysis, that this particular law was invalid, violation of the First Amendment, because it singled out a particular kind of media, it targeted a particular kind of media and restricted it while not restricting anybody else. And the government can't disfavor or destroy a targeted segment of the media. Well, about 10 years ago now, everybody thought that a case headed for the Supreme Court would clarify the rules on what is commercial speech and when it can be restricted by government, uh, presented in the Nike case. Uh, back then, uh, there was a great deal of criticism by union groups, labor groups, environmentalists, uh, workplace safety groups about the working conditions in the factories that uh, Nike used uh, in Asia to make all their shoes, about working long hours for no, low wages and dirty and dangerous working conditions, uh, and so on. And Nike was getting a lot of criticism about that, and so taking a bath in public relations, and so they undertook a campaign, to a, sort of a public relations campaign, to repair its image and to assure people that it was doing a very good job uh, in its... Um, factories of protecting workers and, and the environment and so on. And what they did was they issued some press releases. They wrote letters to newspaper editors who had, for example, taken editorial positions attacking uh, Nike's conditions in Nike factories. Uh, and it wrote letters to universities and to athletic directors in universities who bought Nike products for their athletic teams and so on. Uh, and their communications, all of these kind of communications, defended Nike and said that it's actually doing a good job and it has made changes and so on. Um, but some people did not believe Nike and thought they were fibbing about the changes they had made and the current conditions in those factories. In other words, they thought that this PR campaign was false in some respects. And so one of the critics of Nike's operations sued Nike in state court in San Francisco. The plaintiff was a man named Mark Kasky, who ran Fort Mason, ran the nonprofit company that, uh, that occupies uh, the Fort Mason facility in San Francisco. And he sued under an unusual state law, Fair Business, Unfair Business Practices Act, that gives anybody the right to sue for violations of the law by a company. You don't have to be injured. And Kasky was not injured, not damaged in any way, in any personal way, but he had standing under the law as a sort of private attorney general to sue Nike and potentially uh, subject Nike to millions of dollars in penalties for falsely or misleadingly communicating to the public about its product. Lindsay? Um, did he like, look into their current working conditions? Well, I'm sure he didn't personally go inspect the factories, uh, but he, you know, there, was a, there was a lot still in the newspapers. This was a subject of some public concern, 
where people would say, well, the Nike factory here, somebody went and looked at it and it looked pretty good. And somebody would say, well, it's still, they're still working 16 hour shifts. Uh, or their wage is actually below the minimum wage. And they don't make over, you know, there was debate about, about that uh, that was publicly available. I'm sure that Caskey himself did not go to Asia and snoop around in, in the factories. But he alleged in his lawsuit that what Nike was communicating about its current conditions was false and therefore, therefore violated the California law. And Nike um, uh, moved in the court to dismiss the suit, saying that its communications were protected by the First Amendment. Uh, and the case went to the California Supreme Court, which the issue was, that confronted the court was, basically, if it's commercial speech and it's false, it's not protected and can be completely banned. Um, it, and the court then decided, four to three, uh, in favor of Caskey in 2002, uh, saying that, yes, indeed, um, this um, is commercial speech. Uh, the central Hudson test didn't apply here because this speech is allegedly false or misleading. And therefore, you don't have to get into the other factors in Central Hudson. If it's false, it's not kind of binary. If it's false, it's unprotected. And uh, so the question before the court is, well, it, is this commercial speech? It's alleged to be false. If it's commercial speech, then potentially Nike is going to be liable. And the California Supreme Court says, well, we're, we're going to look to three factors to decide whether this is commercial speech. Is it a commercial speaker? Yes. Is it addressed to an audience that includes potential customers? Yes. Then look at the content of the speech. Are they making representations about their products or their services? Um, for the purpose of promoting sales. Yes, therefore, commercial speech. And since it's alleged to be false, the case continues. Nike is going to have to go to trial. It was four to three in the California Supreme Court. And the dissenters, I remember uh, Ming Chin's uh, dissent in the case, where he said, look, what's going on here is a significant public debate about conditions in Asian factories uh, making products for the American market. Uh, and what you're doing, you, the majority, is handicapping unfairly one side of that debate on the public issues. The attackers, the Mark Kaskis of the world, can't be sued solely because they say something false about Nike. That's a subject which we'll consider in libel, but let me give you a preview. That simply saying something false uh, about a public figure or a company does not mean that you're not protected by the First Amendment. Um, but here, simply saying something false by Nike about its own operations means that it may have to pay million dollars, millions of dollars in fine. Camille? Oh, did Kaskis prove that the statements were false? He did not prove that the statements were false. He alleged that they were false. You know, in his complaint filed in court, it alleged that the statements were false, naming various statements that Nike had made. But it had not, the truth or falsity of the statements had not been determined by a court. Uh, that would happen at trial, where they prove truth or falsity. And there had been a trial yet. It was all on the papers, a determination of whether the case can proceed to trial at all. The court said they can. Well, Justice Chin pointed out how unfair this was. Uh, but the court says, well, that's simply inherent. The unfairness, handicapping one side can say something untrue and the other side can't. That's inherent in the commercial speech doctrine the court says. Uh, the identity of the speaker does matter uh, and determines whether there's, there's pr protection. Seems a little wooden, a little mechanical. Um, if it's commercial speech and it's false, liability, uh, and all commercial speech would be treated the same, uh, having less First Amendment protection than other public discourse. One of the other dissenters in the Nike case, that is, she would rule for Nike and dismiss the case, was then Justice Janice Rogers Brown, uh, who reasoned that uh, her reasoning was, this is hybrid. This is not really commercial speech. It's not like an old-fashioned ad to buy shoes. Uh, these are communications about a matter of public discourse. Uh, and the commercial aspects of the communications, wanting to save Nike from getting dunked by universities, for example, um, were inextricably intertwined with the non-commercial commentary on issues of public moment. And she explicitly invited the US Supreme Court to take the case. The American Civil Liberties Union weighed in on Nike's side of the case, said, What's, what's going on here is public discourse about a significant issue, uh, and this speech is entitled to full First, Amend full First Amendment protection unless the discussion of public issues is a subterfuge or a pretext to avoid regulation. The same kind of notion as in the condom case, where you can't save your commercial speech from restriction simply by sticking in uh, something about public issues. And the ACLU said that um, in judging whether this is um, restrictable as commercial speech, you look to the medium of communication as one factor, um, that is here, what Nike was doing was sending letters to the editor, letters to universities and so on. That's not like paid advertising. You want to look second to the audience. And the audience, in the ACLU's view, was the public at large. That's who Nike is, is trying to reach, the public at large, uh, not just potential institutional buyers like the universities. And third, you want to look to the content of the communications. Are they primarily aimed at selling the product, or are they primarily aimed at trying to influence public opinion? Uh, and if it's the latter, then it ought to be fully protected. Well, the Supreme Court took up Justice... Um, Brown's invitation, and granted certiorari in the case, uh, heard argument, the case was fully briefed, heard argument, and then bailed. The court declined to decide the case and dismissed the writ of certiorari as improvidently granted, which the court occasionally does after 
at least initially saying this is an important issue we need to decide, having it briefed and then argued, and a glitch has appeared in the case in some way, some procedural hitch uh, that the court hadn't foreseen that makes it inappropriate in the court's view to decide the case on the merits. They occasionally dismiss cases as improvidently granted. That's what they did in Nike. They didn't explain why, uh, except in the dissent uh, for, uh, from dismissing the writ. Uh, Justice um, Stephen Breyer dissented, for example, uh, and he was, not the court, to give the court some rationale for dismissing, um, they didn't have to decide the Nike case right then and there on the record that contained nothing about the truth or falsity of the Nike statements. They could just wait until after the case was tried, and if Nike was penalized, then there would be a record that showed exactly what the communications were. That would be a better time for the court to decide the case. But Justice Breyer thought it should be decided right away, and he was troubled by this unusual California law that gave standing to sue anybody to complain whether they'd been injured or not, especially where the lawsuit was about communications involved in a significant public debate. Uh, the court ducked the issue and hasn't clarified uh, the law on what is commercial speech in any case since then. Nike would have been the definitive case on commercial speech, but um, it isn't anymore uh, to that issue. What happened, I mentioned in the, in the reader, after the Supreme Court remanded the case um, for trial is that the case was settled and Nike paid, I forget what the figure was, a million two, something like that, uh, to a nonprofit organization uh, that deals with bad working conditions and so on. So the case was settled. It never did go to trial. And the law remains unsettled because the Supreme Court didn't decide anything. That Nike decision of the California Supreme Court still stands. But it's a little shaky, given the Supreme Court's run at it at the time. So, yeah? Uh, can you explain the commercial speech doctrine, where the majority said that it's inherent that the Nike company had to, any two persons have to be kept to whatever, and what this would have been, what the majority meant to that? Yeah, the, the majority of the California Supreme Court said that the uh, disparity, the alleged unfairness of having one side um, free to attack the other in a false and misleading way, and having that party's speech be protected as against the Nike of the world, or the public figures of the world who have to fight with their hands tied behind their back. Because if they say anything false or malicious, they're going to be penalized. And the California, the majority in the California Supreme Court said that's simply inherent in commercial speech because commercial speech is protected. It's a condition of its protection that it not be false or misleading. This is not true of the rest of us, as we'll see when we get to libel. Now there's one really strong candidate for Supreme Court review in the commercial speech arena, and it involves the um, District of Columbia Circuit's decision last August holding that the federal requirement of graphic warnings on every cigarette package violates the First Amendment. Congress amended the law in 2009, I think it was, uh, and required the Food and Drug Administration to issue new rules for tobacco companies that required them to have not just the old Surgeon General says smoking hurts you or dangerous to your health, whatever it is, but to have nine new textual warnings, which are significantly more blunt, like smoking causes strokes, cancer, and so on, uh, but also to use pictures prescribed by the government on each cigarette package, and they have nine of them. And they're not pretty. Uh, you wouldn't want to particularly see rotting teeth or somebody uh, blowing smoke out of a tracheotomy uh, on your cigarette package as you pull it out. Uh, the idea was that the color graphics are supposed to, de to depict the negative health consequences of smoking. Well, as you can imagine, the cigarette companies hated this idea uh, and brought a suit against the FDA seeking an injunction against enforcement of these cigarette package pictures. Uh, and the case is about the government's power to compel speech that the speaker definitely doesn't want to say. That might trigger, in your now well-informed First Amendment memory, the Jehovah's Witnesses cases, the compelled Pledge of Allegiance, which the court found violate the First Amendment, and perhaps more relevant, the compelled mobile billboard of the New Hampshire license plates that the Jehovah's Witnesses objected to and the court found to be unconstitutional. Uh, the uh, I mean, this stuff is real graphic, uh, autopsy, autopsy pictures and so on. Uh, is it compelled speech that violates the First Amendment? Well, the tobacco companies argue that uh, they are being forced by the government to go beyond informational warnings to consumers with these graphics intended, as the companies argue, to shame and repulse smokers and denigrate smoking as antisocial. These warnings are ideological. They're not informational, and they force the companies to undermine their own economic interests and make every pack, this is what the Court of Appeals said, make every pack a mini billboard for the government's anti-smoking message, picking up on the Woolley license plate case. The opinion of the District of 